Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we are here today to talk about the topic of digital dentistry versus the Stone Age. And what this is going to be is a really great kind of in-depth look at how 3D printing can make your entire workflow work much better in your uh, dental laboratory, particularly as we're transitioning from uh, sort of the traditional uh, method of both model making and dentistry to more of a digital workflow. Uh, we're joined today by Cody Iverson, who's the president of Iver Iverson Dental Laboratories, and he'll be our first presenter. And then a little bit later, we're going to hear from Jeff Youngerman, who's the senior territory manager for Stratasys. Um, I'm going to turn it over to them, but if during the presentation um, you can see below in the GoToWebinar control panel, there's an area to ask questions. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, just type them in there. Make sure that uh, it's, and it'll show up, and then I will compile those and make sure that we have some time at the end to get to those. So uh, with that, Cody, I will turn it over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on applying 3D printing to a production laboratory setting. My name is Cody Iverson. I'm president at Iverson Dental Laboratories in Riverside, California. Today, I'm going to show you three ways in which we have applied 3D printing to our daily production. The first topic I'm going to discuss is the most common application which lab techs begin to inquire about 3D printing. That is 3D printed models for crown and bridge fabrication. Indications include any crown or bridge restoration and most implant restorations. We print a model for all anterior cases, restorations which require hand layering of porcelain and full cast restorations. Advantages include durability. How many times have plaster models been remade because they were abraded or broken? That doesn't happen with print materials. They aren't indestructible, but they can withstand a lot more abuse, ensuring an accurate model at the end of all processes for quality control. The durability of the model material allows us to envelope ship, since the models don't require having packing foam or bubble wrap to keep them from breaking during shipping. This cuts shipping costs significantly. Accuracy. We are printing models which are both sent from an intraoral impression as well as a physical impression which we scan on a desktop scanner. Eliminating the variables from human error to material inconsistency from imp impression material and stone creates a more accurate model. Designing and printing models is faster, less labor intensive, and is much easier to teach new, new technicians. All of the major CAD softwares have a model design component available. The ability to use the model in conjunction with CAD restorations or for hand fabrication means 3D models can be used on nearly every case in the laboratory. This is a, video, a short video uh, showing the model design process using CIRIC in-lab software. The first stage is to choose the restoration as model and then select each of the model pieces for design. We then select a base plate. In this case, it's an anterior case, so I'm going to choose the full arch or the large base. The next step is to arrange the upper and lower models inside the grid. You can rotate anterior to posterior as well as side to side, and you can move them up and down to balance the size of the model or the height of the model. The next step is to ensure that the parameters are set properly. 
There are parameters for just about everything from the pin diameter and the pin spacing to hollowing the model, as well as labeling the model on the side and, the, and on the bottom. The next step is to initialize the segments, which is the same as cutting the die or sawing a die out of a model. So we'll cut along each die, ensuring that we don't uh, cut off any of the margins. We can rotate it to make sure that we cut along the right lines. The next step is ditching. Most intraoral softwares uh, require the doctor to mark the margins. So this is essentially die trimming, which is probably my favorite part of the whole process. So we no longer have to manually die trim. The next step is pinning. Two pins are required for each section. There's an automatic function as well as a manual function if you want to move the pins in, in, into uh, certain areas. Okay, once you've verified that it's correct, we click OK. You can see all of the different pieces with the pins in. Once that's done, the model is going to be created using the parameters and the design that we set. You can see the model has been hollowed out to minimize the amount of material used. There's labeling on the bottom, which is part of the case number, and the pinholes. There's also labeling on the side. There's uppercase letters for the upper model and lowercase letters for each piece of the lower model. At the end of it, there's a legend that shows us how each piece fits within the grid of the base plate, so that once the models are printed, they can be placed on the base plate appropriately so that the byte is preset. No more hand articulation. So then we simply export the file, and it's ready for printing. So the next video is showing model design using the three shape software. So the first step is to trim the preparation model. This will get rid of any distortion as well as minimize the amount of material used to print. The next step is to set the occlusal plane. You can rotate as well as move within the grid to get an ideal occlusal plane.
The next step is to trim the antagonist to opposing model. Again, this eliminates dis the distortion areas as well as minimizes the amount of material used for printing. The next step, the software based on the margin marking will create a die. You can see in, in here it's a purple bluish color. You can also create removable pieces of the model as well if adjacent teeth are uh, divergent. The next step is to choose an articulator interface. There are, there are several uh, pre-made articulator interfaces that you can use. Some have uh, grids already built into them, and uh, some of them have uh, attachments for particular articulators like iTero. This is one that I developed and designed for our uh, use in the laboratory. So you can position it with the models and it will auto-attach itself. You can rotate as well as move it around. What I do is I move it as close to the model as possible on the most posterior section in order to minimize the amount of material used for printing. You can change the uh, label. I really like this function. You can type in whatever you want on it or it, or it will uh, automatically apply the uh, file name. You can move them into a proper position so that to ensure that uh, they're able to be read once they're printed. Once that's done, it's going to uh, merge the articulator to the rest of the file, and the labeling will be applied as well. <clears throat> the labeling is particularly important when you are uh, printing uh, multiple uh, models or surgical guides or anything else um, so that you can easily find what pieces go with each case. Here you can see the articulator is now part of the model. So we'll go to the next step. This is the final step where it's going to separate the die and create the socket for the die to sit in place, as well as separate the upper and lower models and create the indentations for the articulation. And lastly, it's going to hollow the model as well. And all of this is preset in the uh, parameters that you put in. You can have it to where it does not hollow. Um, you can also have it do um, section dies. You can see here this is the finished design. Hollowing the model significantly cuts down on the amount of material needed for printing. Once it's finished, it will be exported. You can see the upper and lower have indentations for the articulator. You, you can use those indentations to hold it uh, stable for either plastic articulation or um, 
you can go on to a fully adjustable articulator as well. <clears throat> so the next topic we're going to talk about is 3D print printed surgical guides. Indications include fully guided implant therapy as well as pilot surgical guides. Advantages are accuracy. With the ability to treatment plan using digital treatment planning software and a cone beam scan means that you are planning for optimal placement in regards to hard tissue density and nerve avoidance. This is much more accurate than pilot surgical guides that are fabricated on a stone model. The tr treatment planning and printing takes less time than fabricating an acrylic surgical guide and manually drilling the pilot holes. Being able to print these guides in the lab means the guide doesn't have to be ordered from a manufacturer in another country, therefore decreasing the treatment for the doctor and patient. Along with speeding up the treatment plan, the implant success rate increases while the chance of nerve damage is greatly reduced if not eliminated. This opens up the opportunity to expand your product line to your existing accounts as well as new clientele. The last topic is 3D printed removable partial frameworks. Indications are, of course, cast metal partial frameworks. Advantages include accuracy. The fit and finish of partials that are casted from a 3D print will rival any hand waxed framework. Because the design is controlled by the software, the consistency of design, fit, and thickness is the same for each case. From designing to finishing the metal framework, the process is much faster than hand waxing. It is much easier to teach new technicians and the ability to have a manager draw the design on the model before scanning makes the design process able to be performed by a technician with less experience. If your lab is currently sending partial frameworks to another lab for fabrication, this process allows you to keep that product in-house and reduce the turnaround time significantly. Here's a video showing the design process for removable partial frameworks using 3Shape software. The first step is to identify or survey and block out any undercuts. Next we apply the Retention grids and major connectors where appropriate. Then we apply the class appropriately for the design, and there are different types of class with different thicknesses and widths to choose from. Next is to finish the design by 
cleaning up the finish lines. Then moving on to the pre-manufacturing, where we can uh, put sprue bars in place so that it, they are printed with the partial attached to or attached to the partial. This decreases the amount of time uh, it takes to sprue them up and get them ready for casting. You can choose different diameters and angles and once that's completed, the sprue bars become part of the partial design, as you can see here. And the final step is they are exported to be ready for printing. The last video I'm going to show is the uh, Stratasys nesting software. So once you have all the pieces that are going to be printed, you build a tray and you can bring the, the uh, pieces onto a tray either individually or you can bring multiple pieces in at one time. You want to make sure that your settings are right. Uh, we use high quality matte for all of our printing. Seems to have the uh, best result, most accurate result. You can do a high speed as well if necessary. So then we'll click on placement and it will auto placement, auto place the uh, pieces for the shortest amount of print time. And we click validate. Then estimate. And you can see here it will estimate the amount of each of the materials needed to print as well as the building time. Then we click build. And it will ask us to save the tray. We use the date and then we use one, two, three, a consecutive number after that for each day. Once we click Save, it's going to pack the job and move it over to the job manager where it will send the information to the printer to start printing. When making a large investment such as CAD CAM manufacturing equipment, you have to take several items into account. Return on investment is the one topic that every company begins the sales conversation with. How long will it take to see a return on the initial investment? I can tell you from my experience there is never an immediate ROI on a new product or system. So you have to ask the question, is this piece of equipment along with the company that services it going to be around to help me see the return on my investment? The quality and of the equipment and the accuracy at which it produces the products you are providing to your clients is of utmost importance. Support and service are probably the most important topic when making a major equipment purchase. A large investment in your company is not only financial, it is a true commitment to learn and master the technology you have purchased. You need to make sure that you will have a team behind you to keep your education and equipment moving in the right direction. You must also ensure that parts for repair of the equipment are available and inexpensive. That's exactly what we found with Stratasys. Thank you for your time, and should you have any additional questions after the Q&A session, feel free to email me.
Cody, thank you very much. That was great, great information. I think what impressed me most about Cody and his brother and just the way they run their whole business is they're not afraid to invest in the technology. It's proven time and time again to allow them to grow their business. You can see even just as a new user of the 3D printing, how he's already been able to implement it into his business and not only go with the conventional methods and switching them over, but developing new products for his laboratory as well. My name is Jeff Youngerman. I'm the Western Territory Manager for Stratasys. Um, I've been selling subtractive added manufacturing for over 10 years and been with Stratasys just a little bit over a year now. And I got to tell you, it is the most exciting thing I've ever worked with. So I'm excited to have this presentation. I appreciate you guys taking the time to get on the call with us and listen to what we have to say. I want to just show a quick video here. There's no sound to this video, but I think you'll get the idea of what it's about. Probably the most exciting part about 3D printing is that it's not only changing the way manufacturers do business, but it's changing people's lives. And being part of that is a pretty exciting place to be. So as a representative of Stratasys and, of course, an advocate of dental, it's pretty exciting to see where 3D printing is today and knowing the future of 3D printing. It's just absolutely incredible. Um, I'm not a big fan of going through how much machines weigh and sizes and these things, we'll be happy to supply those. I just want to give you a basic overview as to how 3D printing works, just so you have an idea of what the printers are actually doing. So everything is based off of a STL file. We're very familiar with these STL files. They're open format files. It's simply taking it from any device that can create an STL file. Uh, we then slice that STL. Well, first we close it off, excuse me. Then we do what we do is uh, put it into slice layers. The printer sees each one of those layers and will print it in either a 16 micron or 28 micron layer, depending on the application. Once that build is completed, that's it. The, the, the print is done. There's nothing else that needs to be done. So all of this uh, 3D uh, printing, all the STL files, these are all achieved through third-party softwares. 
Uh, Cody gave a demonstration of a couple of the model builder softwares as a great example. So once your design is done, all we're going to do is we're going to slice it and then we're going to print it. From there, it goes into our printer. Our printer is very, very tech, uh, from a technology standpoint, it's very sophisticated where it's actually jetting out a liquid polymer. Uh, once this polymer is jetted out, it's instantly cured with a UV light. This means that we don't have any uncured resins on the build trays. We don't waste any materials. At the same time, it also builds a support material, which is then very easily cleaned off either using a water jet or now we have a soluble support material that would go into a soluble support tank, uh, which is a little bit more hands-free. But we're watching this technology develop. We're watching, obviously, the materials develop and definitely an exciting process. But as far as the printing goes, it's about as simple as it gets. Once you hit print, you step away from the machine and the machine will go ahead and continue printing until the print job is completely done. Uh, the software also lets you know how much material is being used, the time it will take, uh, make sure you, you have enough material and things like that. So what I want to do is I want to start with a quote that I have from Glidewell Laboratories. I think most people are familiar with this laboratory. They have several of our printers as well. Um, one of the things they said is Stratus slash object printers survive the Glidewell ecosystem. As, as we know, this is a manufacturer of, of a very, very large scale. Um, they've implemented our printers. Uh, they're, they're very reliable for them. They're getting a lot of production out of it. They've had the opportunity to work with several other printers as well. Uh, Stratus has is, is definitely been the one that's been uh, the one that's been able to uh, keep up with their production. You know, in, in the laboratory, we know there's a lot of challenges that we're facing today. Uh, there's overseas competition, it's decreasing profit margins, et cetera. You can see from this list, I'm sure at least everybody sees one or two within this list. But, you know, we, we're always trying to find ways to overcome this. And I think the only way to truly overcome this is to implement digital within the laboratory. We saw this transition happen several years ago, and we see it to continue to be true in, in today's market, and we know in future markets as well. We can't continue doing things so, so labor intensive and uh, manual labor and, and skilled labor, and we, we are constantly looking to get to that next level, but we don't, have the, we don't really have the technicians out there that are capable of doing it. So it's these softwares and the digital process that is taking that technician today that has a great understanding of what they do and are very good at what they do and using this as a tool to get to that next level. Once we get to that next level, we can, we can overcome pretty much any of these challenges that we see in front of us. The traditional laboratory looks similar to this. You know, how many doctors are saying, well, you know, I, I need Eric to work on my case. He's the only one that really understands what I'm doing. And, you know, for the other cases, you know, Rose is okay, but, you know, she's good on posterior, but not good on anterior. Well, this is how, this is how the traditional lab looks to a doctor. Everyone has their own signature. It's very different. It's very very difficult to duplicate and scale. In today's world, when we're talking about a digital lab, the signatures are all the same. It doesn't matter who is doing the process. Digitally, you're going to create a, a level of consistency and accuracy that every technician will be able to achieve. Now when it goes out the door, it, it's, it goes out under the laboratory name and, and your trademark and not necessarily the technician's name or trademark. So this is an exciting time to be part of digital because we see this transition happening very, very quickly. Cody, Cody Iverson and the Iverson folks over there have seen this, I mean, almost, not. I, I, I want to say overnight because it seems like overnight, but they've worked really hard to get to this point. And I think their doctors appreciate what they've done. Listen, this is nothing new for us when we look at impressions and some of the challenges that we face. So. Uh, you can see from some of these pictures, I'm sure you've experienced this and the inconsistencies. You know, 3D printing right now, there's a big focus on the model printing, having a digital solution or, or a model solution for these digital impression units. But we also know that the digital impression market is not as big as what we feel it should be. So we try to take a look at this and understand what's happening. And what we think is happening is simple. The the Digital units that exist today, A, are very expensive, which is a limiting factor for doctors, and then you attach the cost of a model to it, and it just becomes cost prohibitive for the average doctor. So 
now that we have 3D printing available for laboratories uh, where you can take control of that process, you can save a substantial amount of cost and provide this service. This is a service that doesn't necessarily exist in every dental laboratory, but it could exist. And that's one of the big advantages with investing in the technology, especially newer technology. Uh, not to mention infection control and uh, you know multiple impressions and things like that that the doctors spend a lot of money on. These digital impression units are coming down in price now. And like I say, with the uh, implementation of a 3D printer, you can get these models all day long, whether it be for uh, crown and bridge application or ortho application. So the solution is simple, right? We move to a digital impression solution. When you move to digital impression, you save a lot of steps for the doctor. And in addition to saving a lot of steps for the doctor, we save a lot of steps for the laboratory. And with each one of these process, it adds another variable to the, to the model making process. So ideally what we want to do is eliminate all of this, go straight from a digital impression, which is the impression of what's in the patient's mouth, and put it right into a printer and, and achieve an, ac an accurate result. The digital process is quite simple. Doctor takes the impression. That impression comes to the, to the laboratory. Digitally, you're splitting the file. You're creating a crown off of one file. You're creating a model off of the other. The two are married up and they're sent back to the dentist. This decreases your turnaround time, which adds more value to, your, to the services and products that you, you uh, provide. Your doctor gets a better, better experience, the laboratory has a better experience, and most importantly, the patient has a much better experience. So this, this whole idea of intraoral scanning, you know, if I talk to most laboratories today, well, I get one, I get two, you know, I have a couple doctors, most of them are not interested. If we really dig deep and find out why they're not interested, I think it's more cost related than anything else because there is no doubt that these intraoral scanners are becoming more and more popular, they're less money, and they're extremely accurate. Some of the, the uh, added manufacturing benefits, you know, opening up new revenue opportunities. Cody said it perfectly when he was doing his presentation. These were opportunities that didn't exist before because you had to send these products out of state, out of country. Um, you know, we're, we're supporting other, other manufacturers around the world rather than taking control of it ourselves. So, you know, differentiating your business, being able to provide products and services that the average laboratory cannot provide. Uh, completing your digital workflow. If we look at the digital workflow the way it is today, it gets interrupted very quickly with that model solution. So having that model solution in-house allows you to create these high-resolution dental models and complete that entire digital process. It's also a repeatability thing. You have the ability to do multiple prints. If we think about the first impression that comes in, we pour it up and, and we struggle to get that first pour because that's our margin and then everything else is secondary. Well, what happens when that margin gets abraded during a manufacturing process? I, I know as a metal finisher, it never happened to me where I hit a margin doing a metal finish, but you know, sometimes it ha I've heard through the grapevine it happens. Listen, all you have to do is simply hit print again and you get the exact same product that you had the first time you hit print. Okay, and then, you know, there is a cost associated with outsourcing. That starts adding up real quick. So we get caught in this catch-22. We want to do digital uh, dentistry, but we don't want to pay somebody else for these models and the high cost of the models. And the early adopters in this, in this technology world and dental in pretty much every industry will definitely win. You're seeing huge growth very quickly. Cody went out with, with virtually minimal amount of digital business and purchased two printers, not one, but purchased two, and now is keeping them both running with different, with different uh, applications. So those applications obviously will continue to grow as we go, but it's the early adopters that will, that will be able to offer these products and services that the average laboratory will not be able to do. So just to give you a quick overview of our printers and what's available, we have three main printers that we sell within our dental space. We have what we call an orthodesk. It's catered more towards the smaller laboratory, basically just doing ortho models. It has a 28 micron layer print, not really accurate enough for doing the uh, partials or the uh, crown and bridge models, but excellent for doing ortho applications and surgical guides. Then we have the 260 VS, the dental advantage model, runs four different materials. 
designed for both crown and bridge and ortho applications. This will run at either a 16 micron print or 28 micron print. This is a more uh, industrial type of unit where it's designed to run pretty much 24-7 if you were to choose. In addition to that, you also have the uh, throughput capability that you don't have on the ortho desk. And then we go to our bigger boy, the Eden 500V. Handles the same materials, but again, the throughput is significantly more. So as we look at these three models and at all the different price points, you know, within, within one of these models, we should be able to find a printer that's going to suit your needs. And that's what, that's what we're here for as well. Our newest printer, which we're pretty excited about, we released this in Cologne, is called the 260 Dental Selection. This is a triple jetting technology. You'll notice off to the right there, there's a separate box that we can put in multiple cartridges of different color materials and things like that. So initially what we're looking at is we're looking at colored models, more realistic models. We're able to change the texture of the material that's printed to make it a little bit softer. So for gingival mask or if we want to do maybe denture trine or something along those lines. But again, it supports all the open color interval scanners. So your uh, uh, three shape scanner and the Serona scanner, those are all color scanners and we'll see a lot more coming to market. Uh, very soon. Those can all be printed in those exact colors, which is pretty cool, pretty exciting. Again, it's a, it's a unique application. I think uh, once you have a consultation by one of the territory managers, we would be able to help you decide whether this is the right printer for you or not. So this is kind of where we started with Stratasys, is with our ortho applications. We, we knew very easily that we could print an ortho model. It was very accurate, very consistent. And this is really where our strength has been up until a little over a year ago when Stratasys hired a dental team. And this has made a huge difference. We have a, a national sales manager for dental. We have three territory managers like myself that are highly skilled in the dental industry. And then we've also hired um, an application engineer has a CDT as well uh, that works out of our main office. So what we learned through this experience is the model builders, parameters, we have a much, much better understanding, which has allowed us to move to the next level away from ortho and get into these crown and bridge models. Now we can see highly, highly accurate, high resolution crown and bridge models with removable dyes. We have, you know, extended dyes. We have separate dyes. We live in a world of microns and we understand that. And the problem is the ortho world does not live in microns. But now that we have an understanding, again, of the parameters and how these model builders work, we can achieve some excellent results. And you can see just an example of a couple models here, uh, and then also these colored models that are produced off of the dental selection, the, the newest printer of us. Surgical guides. You know, we're always looking for applications to open up uh, additional revenue within a laboratory. These softwares now are becoming more readily available. Uh, surgical guide planning, implant planning, allows you to, to take these DICOM files directly out of the cone beam scans, do a design process, create a surgical guide, and print a surgical guide. It is a very, very inexpensive process to print this guide and a very, very high profit item. So for a laboratory that's looking to expand revenue and open up other business opportunities, this is an excellent way to do it. Diagnostic wax up, again, you know, we look at these 3D printers and we're like, yeah, they're really cool, but what do we do with it? Here's another unique application of doing a diagnostic wax up. Instead of hand waxing, we have a shaded uh, model material uh, called Vero Glaze, which is an A2 shaded material that you can print out. You can send that to the doctor so a patient can see a diagnostic wax up. They can do adjusting on it send that model back, that can then be scanned back into your software, and you can duplicate that as a final restoration. Here's another unique item of an all-on-four try-in. You'll see there's actually five access holes on this, but you get the idea. So uh, this laboratory takes this. This is then tried into the patient's mouth. If everything fits, then it's milled out of zirconia. We know how expensive these zirconia pucks can be, and you don't want to get to the end product to find out that something doesn't fit. So Another great application, again, going way outside of the box beyond just a simple uh, 
uh, dental model. And then the study models. These are done off of these multi-jet printers. Uh, the triple jet will be able to do this. Now we can do it and add color to it. You can see the colored nerve in that centered picture. We tend to send, sell these more to uh, laboratories and universities that are doing a lot of education type of training where they want to be able to really break down each component of either the jaw, or the skull, or, or both. And then, of course, the uh, removable partial denture, which Cody showed a, a great e example of that. This is something that, again, we have not had a castable solution up until recently. So uh, being able to do these partial frames, we know throughout our customer base there's thousands of them being done a month very successfully, very accurate, a lot, lot less labor intensive, uh, and a lot more consistency. So we have the ability to do it here as well. This would have to be done with the 260 BS and above printer because they need to be printed at a 16 micron layer for accuracy. And you know, as, as, a, as a company the size of Stratasys, there's always new applications on the horizon. We are constantly developing, investing into our business, investing into your business, trying to show growth within the dental industry and of course, create new applications and opportunities for both us as a manufacturer and you as a business or a laboratory. So it comes time to making a decision. You know, we look at these different things and we have to decide, first of all, is this a fad or a trend? Well, I think everyone would agree at this point that this is definitely a trend. We, we, see, we see this coming into many markets, dental, dental not being excluded from any of that, and we see how quickly this, this technology is growing. Uh, we also know that there's a lot of materials coming down that will be, uh, uh, get, or, or I'm sorry, not to be, but to add additional applications to your business as well. You know, I, I put down a couple things here, zirconia and ceramics. What I wanted to say is, you know, when these products first came to market, there there was no ROI associated with it. And I think uh, Cody did a good job of explaining that ROI in today's market. These were products that somebody had a vision on. They took it, they ran with it, and did unbe unbelievably well. The late adopters to these products really fell behind very quickly. So where labs were paying off multiple milling units and their software and design stations, other labs were sending to them to help them make those payments. As, as opposed to owning the technology, committing to the technology, growing it within their own business, you know, digitizing their workflow and really understanding the opportunities, that's that's those are the guys that are most successful. And we see the leaders of our industry stepping up very quickly on the 3D printing side of, of, of our business. And you have to remember, these are scalable automation. There's new products that are coming out all the time that you're simply plugging in a cartridge and you're going through the same printing. There's always a wait and see. We could just wait and see. Let's see what Cody does. But I will tell you what Cody's going to do. Cody's going to be incredibly successful as all the customers will be as they continue to invest in the technology. The, the, the labor force is getting smaller and smaller. It's getting more and more expensive to run that labor force. And without the technology, we're just not going to be able to achieve what we need. So you need to have that visionary R and I, ROI. You need to be able to sit down and go, all right, so I get it. Maybe I don't have that much work right now. I've got some. But gosh, I, I have so many areas of opportunity here to grow my business. And that's really what we want you to see. We want you to understand those opportunities and, and talk to the reps and talk to our advocates and talk to people like Cody and find out how they implemented the technology. Look, it's not cheap to, to invest in technology, but when you see the return and you see the opportunity and how it differentiates you, that's where it makes a big difference. You know, there's always a follow the leader concept. We'll just, you know, see what everyone else is doing. They obviously know what they're doing. Let's follow them, and we'll figure it out. So everyone's going to have their own way of moving forward, but understand that there's huge, huge opportunity in 3D printing and dental, especially now since it's all new. Okay. Um, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time. Uh, there's going to be an opportunity to ask some questions here as well. Uh, I put down three names down here, myself, Barry Diener, and Jacob Oppenheimer. We're the three territory managers across the entire U.S. Uh, and, and through Canada. 
any one of us would be able to help you answer any questions. We can set up a, a day where we come into the laboratory, uh, show you what we can do, talk to you about uh, business opportunities, etc. Uh, we also have the ability for you to send in an STL file. Uh, we could do benchmarking for you if you're you know, serious about moving forward on a printer. So with that, I want to thank you very much. I want to thank Cody for his time as well. And then if there's any questions, our moderator will be able to uh, ask those for us. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Great presentation. Um, and thank you, Cody, as well. Um, I have just a few questions um, that I got and kind of uh, thought of while you guys were presenting. Um, I guess first for Jeff, um, one question is, can you print, print any file? Okay, that's a great question. So we want to be very clear that any STL file, any open STL file, regardless of the manufacturer and software, can be printed with this 3D printer, yes. Okay, cool. And then what kind of digital impression systems, you talked a lot about that, but what, which digital impression systems will the printer work with? So most of the impression systems that are on the market today will generate that STL file. So from that standpoint, I, I would say all of them. The only one that's a little bit unique, and Cody actually showed it within his presentation, would be the Serona scanner, which just simply needs to go through a uh, in-lab software, which is their proprietary software, and then it can be exported out through a model builder, not model builder, I'm sorry, but a uh, open model license that's available, and then you can print it as well. So as long as we have all those components in place, any STL file, any impression system will be able to work with our printer. Okay. Um, I've got a question for either of you to answer. This was a question from a viewer. Um, how are manufacturers taking care um, of, of deformation of materials that is not stable even when totally cured? Okay, so the, uh, the challenge, the only challenge we have as far as distortion goes is anything above 130 degrees Fahrenheit will distort the material. So I think what's being referenced, there's other materials out there that are partially cured and they have to be handled in a situation where they're placed in a black box and no light can hit it because it'll change it dimensionally. We do right. not have this issue with, with our materials. The photopolymer resin is 100% cured and 100% stable. With the exception of 130 degrees Fahrenheit, like I said, you will not have any distortion at all with these models. Okay. Um, Cody, uh, what about uh, printing crown and bridge restorations? We're actually currently testing that with Stratasys. Um, what we've found so far is that it creates uh, somewhat of a rough surface. Um, so we're playing around with uh, a couple different support materials and then also um, different print uh, processes or specifications uh, to get a little bit of a smoother finish to it. Um, I actually did a test this morning and um, I got a very smooth finish. As far as fit goes, um, and like Jeff had said, you can do any STL, any open STL restoration. Um, so fit and, and marginal integrity would be based on the scan and uh, the design um, process and the parameters that are, are built into the design software. So um, from a standpoint of can it work, yes it can. Uh, one of the biggest drawbacks is also um, handling the uh, burnout process if you're going to cast or, or press something. Um, it's, it's a bit sensitive, but there are some new uh, uh, investments that are out on the market now that handle the material very well and, and stay very stable during the, uh, the uh, burnout process. Okay. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about that, um, just kind of piggyback on that. Is there, is there any difference that you found in the casting or burnout processing when casting printed frameworks? Yeah, it's primarily with the burnout process. Um, this material doesn't melt the same way that wax and some of the other plastics or acrylics do. It uh, tends to um, incinerate more so. Um, so that, so y you have to handle it a little bit differently. It is a little bit lengthier process for burning out. Um, I know that uh, Nobilium uses a, uh, a ramping period. 
um, we found that to take too much time, so we, we uh, you know, did some R&D on um, using a two-stage burnout process where we put it in an oven for um, an hour at 700 degrees, then we put it in a secondary oven that's already preheated uh, for, the, for another um, hour uh, for, and it, you know, it's dependent upon what you're doing, whether you're casting or whether you're pressing um, that final temperature. Like cast partials, uh, we have it at 1900, 1900 degrees for an hour for the final process. And this has worked very well. No, no uh, investment breakdown or thinning or anything like that. Okay. Um, just a, a couple of questions, I guess, and whichever one of you can handle this or you can split it up. Um, about models, uh, how many models can someone print at a time using a Stratasys printer, and then can those models be designed from the same file as the crown? Let me let me answer the first part, and I'll let Cody answer the second part, as it deals more with the uh, model builder software. Okay. This is this is always a question that comes up. You know, how many, how much, etc. The depending on how they're designed, you know, there's a lot of different designs. So let's just use two examples of a quadrant or a horseshoe arch. On a quadrant arch, you're going you're gonna to average about somewhere, somewhere in the neighborhood of 36 to 40 prints, meaning if that was an upper and lower model, we're looking at somewhere around uh, 18 to 20 upper lower models, and that will fit on a tray. If you're doing, let's say, a horseshoe print, you're looking more like 16 to 20, uh, it depends more on the size than it does anything else. So the bill plate is about a 10 by 10, or actually it's about 11 by 11 bill plate size. So you can get a lot of a lot of uh, models on there. Your print times can be anywhere from maybe six to eight hours, and that depends also on vertical height. Uh, if it was just one model, it could be done in maybe an hour to an hour and a half. So. There's a lot of variables to that particular question, but I think that's a good overview. And then, Cody, if you could handle more of the splitting of that file and how that yeah, works, so, please. Yeah, so I'll, I'll actually expand on what you were talking about. What we do is um, we actually design and print in the same day. We also uh, mill or uh, you know do whatever we need to do with the restoration the same day they're designed. So what we do is we do them in batches. The way the printer uh, works in order to uh, save as much time uh, for each process is it makes passes across each portion of the grid. And you can see it's broken down. Um, on my video I showed on the Stratus software, the tray is actually broken down in different sections. So it's going to pass over the first top or the top section first, and then it's going to move to the next section and then so on. So what we do is we try to fill up that first tray and then um, it, it, it pretty much, dependent on the height, like Jeff was talking about, it will do a full pass um, in about the same amount of time as it would one single die. It's a little bit lengthier, but not much longer. So it's when you start going into the different passes or the different grids, um, that's when it takes a little more time. So we found that it's better to do it in batches rather than run a five, you know, four or five hour cycle of a full tray. Um, now, the second part of the question was, can you um, print and manufacture the crown at the same time? Um, it, the, the design softwares are a little bit different, um, but they usually will do both um, at the same time. So CIRIC has uh, where you design the crown, and then you just simply click on the model as a, um, a secondary design, if you will. And it applies all of the um, settings that were already done to the, the virtual model um, in the design process of the crown. It applies that to the model, so it cuts or eliminates um, some of the steps that have to be done in the design. Once the file is complete and closed and saved, then the, um, the, both the model as well as the restoration are automatically output as uh, files that you can process, whether additive or uh, subtractive manufacturing. Um, three Shape does it a little bit different. They, again, they have you go through the design process of the restoration first. And again, some of the um, processes like trimming the model and marking the margin and things like that are applied um, once the model is designed. But it's actually a separate module that 
that uh, designs the model. So it, it, I, it, I think it actually takes a little bit, I mean, I know it takes a little bit more time with 3Shape because it's got to close the uh, design software for the restoration and then open up the model restoration or the model design software and then you go through the steps there. But they can be done. The shorter answer is they can be done at the same time. Okay. Um, one last question for each of you. Uh, first, Jeff, do you have to fill the whole tray before printing? That's a that's actually a great question. No, you do not. The the printers that we sell will only print what's on the tray. So that could be as simple as a single die or a full tray of models. You decide. Okay. Um, it, it does not ghost print where it fills up a whole tray and runs it across. It just will print what is on that tray. Okay, cool. Yep. And then, um, Cody, you talked a lot about surgical guides, and I know that's going to be something um, that a lot of lab technicians are interested in learning more about is it's a great growth opportunity. Um, what software are you, using, are you using to design surgical guides? Currently, we're using Code Diagnostics. Um, it was a. It was originally something that Strawman had launched. It's a Dental Wings product, but they um, kind of created this software with Dental Wings, and then they relied on the Strawman reps to basically uh, sell it. And uh, we purchased that, and it it came with a. Um, you you bought a a manual drilling. Um, sequence and it was it was a full stand and what you would do is design it you you create an acrylic uh, surgical guide you design it on the software and it would output all of the specs that you would uh, apply to this um, surveyor that had a handpiece on it and you would drill out the holes manually and then you would insert the uh, the uh, sleeves so um, once we invested in the printers. It was a very easy uh, marriage in, you know, taking that same software and moving it into just u utilizing printing uh, as opposed to, you know, manually making acrylic stents. Okay, great. Well, um, thank there, you. There, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. One, one more thing. Uh, Three no. Shape does have a, a design software for, or an implant studio, they call it. Okay. Um, we've just been so in depth with code diagnostics that we we've stuck with it. It's really worked well for us. Okay, great. Well, it's good for people to know that there's options out there too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again to Cody and Jeff. Uh, great presentation. Um, and thank you to everyone who took time out of their day to come join us for this webinar. Um, we're going to send you out a link too if you'd like to see anything any part of it again, um, just to make sure that.